Good morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you're watching this. Uh, today we're going to discuss the product life cycle and how it relates to what we're doing in class as far as reinventing new products, rebranding, adding branding lines. So we're going to talk about how products are introduced into the market and their kind of natural life cycle as they go through the marketplace. So um, product life cycle cycle stages explained. There are, um, every product has um, a life cycle of four stages, very clearly defined, each within its own characteristics. It means different things for businesses that are trying to manage the life cycle of their particular products. So the first stage is the introduction stage. This stage of the cycle could be the most expensive for a company launching a new product. The size of the market for the product is small, which means sales are low, although they will be increasing. On the other hand, the cost of things like research and development, consumer testing, and the market needed to launch a product can be very high, especially if it's a competitive sector. So you think about the product introduction stage. You've got a product, you want to take it to market. It requires a lot of seed money. Um, you're going to be spending a lot as a company getting this product up and going, so it's a lot of research, development, testing. There can be production delays. There can be um, if you found, you know, if your vendor isn't working out for you that's manufacturing something, there can be financing delays as far as how do we get the money, how much money do we need to get this to the market. Um, and it's also, does anybody know about this product? How, how are we sure people are even going to buy it if we make it? So um, there's a lot of upfront cost as well as saying, okay, how do we get people uh, aware of our product and purchasing it? It doesn't matter if it's a great product if nobody knows about it nobody's going to buy it. So that's the introduction stage. So profits are low if you're profiting anything at all. A lot of times most companies lose money on a new product when that first comes out because they're, they're launching it, they're trying to get it running. The next stage is the growth stage. The growth stage is typically characterized by strong growth in sales and profits. Because a company can start to benefit from economies of scale in production, the profit margins as well as overall amount of profit will increase. This makes it possible for businesses to invest more money in the promotional activity and maximize the potential of this growth stage. So once you hit the growth stage, that means you've smoothed out all the wrinkles, all the snafus in production. You've got your product, you're producing it, you um, can now make larger runs, you can more accurately predict, okay, how many are we going to sell in this particular quarter? Let's plan for that. Let's produce it. You're generally producing larger volumes of products, so that's cheaper overall to make more than doing small runs. Um, so in your people are now aware of your product, so they're saying, oh, I know this. I'm going to go out and buy this. Um, and you can promote. Your, you know who to promote to, how to promote. Um, your product is growing in popularity. Then we hit the maturity stage. Um, during the maturity stage, the product is established and the aim for the manufacturers to now maintain the market share they have built up. This is probably the most competitive time for most products, is it products and businesses need to invest wisely in any marketing they undertake. They also need to consider any product modifications or improvements to the production process which might give them a competitive advantage. So in this maturity stage, um, you've now got a stake of your market share. You're the product out there. Um, you're fighting, so other competitors may have arisen if you had a really new and unique idea. Um, copycat, different competitors are rising up and trying to take their place and their chunk of your market share. So this is where um, companies have to differentiate. What are we doing? How can we make it better? Can we make it cheaper? Can we make it faster? Can we make it work longer? What can, can we make something new and different that nobody else has? That's how you're going to maintain your product share in the maturity stage. How do you keep a product new and fresh for years to come? And then we have the decline stage. Eventually the market for a product will start to shrink. And this is what's known as the decline stage. This shrinkage could be due to the market becoming saturated, i.e. all the other customers who will buy the product have already purchased it, or because the consumers are switching to a different type of product. While this decline may be inevitable, it may still be possible for companies to make some profit by switching to less expensive production methods and cheaper markets. 
So during the decline stage, um, there's, there may be just a ton of competition. There may be somebody who's doing it better, faster, cheaper than you. Uh, it could be that people just are no longer interested in your product. Your product is old. It's outdated. Nobody wants it anymore. We've moved on to newer, fresher, better things. Um, if your product has not been able to keep up with uh, the demands and changes in technology, then it may end up declining and going away. So what are some of the challenges of the introduction stage? Um, one of the first is smaller no market. When a new product is launched, there's typically no market for it. Or if a market does exist, it is likely to be very small. Naturally, this means that sales are going to be low to start off with. There will be occasions where a great new product or fantastic marketing campaign will create such a buzz that sales take off right away. But these are generally special cases, and it often takes time and effort before most products achieve this kind of momentum. So, um, if you think of places such as Indiegogo or Kickstarter, there's lots of pretty interesting projects out there, but if it's something no one's ever heard of, they don't know if it's going to work right, that's a very small niche market. Um, so if it's something new that people have just never heard of, they don't know what to do with it, they don't know if they need it in their lives because it's just that new, there's no market. Um, you don't have the clout of your brand name yet because you're a brand no one's heard of. High costs. Very few products are created without some research and development. For, and once they're created, many manufacturers will need to invest in marketing and promotion in order to achieve the kind of demand that it will that will make their new products a success. Both of these can cost a lot of money, and in the case of some markets, these could run into many millions of dollars. So it's very expensive to take an idea and get it to um, the marketplace. Depending on what you're needing to do, it's, it requires research and development. You need to research, you need to prototype. Every prototype you make costs money. The prototypes have to be um, tested and quality assurance has to be created. A lot of times there's legal and regulatory commissions who are looking over and overseeing what you're making. So it has to pass those legal and regulatory commissions to say, okay, this product is safe for use. You can't take it, you can't just make something and put it out there. It's got to be proven to be safe, proven to be effective. Um, it's so that's where a lot of that cost comes in is uh, you generally have to pay those third parties um, to basically assure that your product is safe to go into the marketplace. That's true of so many industries that, you know, there's, there's that quality assurance so that when it hits the end user and marketplace, people can be assured that what they're getting is a quality product. So that costs a lot, a lot of money. So, um, and then the third is loss is not profits. With all the cost of getting a new product to market, most companies will see negative profits in the initial stage of product life cycle. Although the amount and duration of these negative profits does differ from one market to another, some manufacturers could start showing a profit quite quickly, while for other companies in other sectors, it could take years. Um, it's very expensive on new ideas. I believe Amazon, Amazon.com lost money for something like six or eight years, the first almost decade of the company. I'm not sure on total years, but it can take years and years for a company to start seeing true profits. Um, so the losses could be just a couple months, it could be a year, it could be multiple years before really profits take off, just because it's so costly to pay for research development um, getting your manufacturing set up. So benefits of the introduction stage. Uh, the number one is that limited competition. If the product is truly original and the business is the first to manufacture and market it, the lack of direct competition would be a distinct advantage. Being first could help an organization to capture a large market share before some of the other companies started launching competing products. And in some instances, it can enable a business's brand to become synonymous with a whole range of products like Tylenol, Post-its, Kleenex, and Hoover. So if you think of something like if you say, hey, I have a headache, hey, I need some Tylenol. You're not really asking for brand name Tylenol. Maybe you are, but other times you may be actually just saying, hey, it could be ibuprofen or Advil or any other painkiller in that name. But you just say, hey, I need a Tylenol. Hey, I need a, I need a Kleenex. 
You're not saying I need a tissue, I need a Kleenex. That brand name has become synonymous with the product it represents. You know, your post-it notes could be knockoff post-its, no-name sheets of paper with the glue strip on it. You call them post-its because that was a unique product from 3M called post-its, and a lot of competing products came to follow suit. Uh, high price. Manufacturers that are launching a new product are often able to charge prices that are significantly significantly above what will eventually become the average market price. This is because early adopters are prepared to pay this higher price to get their hands on the latest products, and it allows the company to recoup some of its cost of developing and launching the product. In some situations, however, manufacturers might do the exact opposite and offer relatively low prices in order to stimulate the demand. Uh, a lot of times, being some of the first products on the market are going to be expensive. If you think about um, Tesla's solar-powered cars and their Tesla's Elon Musk's solar-powered roof, that's one of the new, you know, it's a, a new product on the street where it's like, okay, you can have this cool solar-powered roof, but it's going to be pretty expensive. And they, you know, if you look at that product in particular, they are projecting that it's going to fall, the, the cost of those solar roofs are going to fall over time. However, you know, some of the first people to that technology, they're going to pay a much higher price. Product life cycle management in the introduction stage. So the initial stage of the product life cycle is all about building the demand for the product with the consumer and establishing the market for the product. The key emphasis will be on promoting the new product as well as making production more cost effective and developing the right distribution channels to get the product to market. So these are all really important things. How do I get my product to the market? Um, there's a lot to iron out as far as it, when people place orders, can you get them their, their product quickly in a timely manner so people aren't canceling orders, making sure that it's getting there without being damaged um, in any way. And also, so streamlining that production and also getting in the consumer consciousness that, hey, we need this product. You know, you may have never heard of a solar roof before, but now that you think about it, maybe you really do need that. How do, how do you get people to think about, well, I've never heard of it, and now I want it. Now I want to buy it. Now I need this in my life, even though it's something that I hadn't thought of or hadn't known before. Think about the iPhone, one of the first smartphones out there. People didn't have smartphones. They made the market for it. They built the need. Challenges of the growth stage. So once we get into the growth stage, there's increasing competition. When a company is the first one to introduce a product into the market, they have the benefit of little or no competition. However, when the demand for the product starts to increase and the company moves into the growth phase of the product life cycle, they're likely to face increased competition as new manufacturers look to benefit from a new developing market. So we'll go back to um, the iPhone example, when the smartphone came out. The iPhone was one of the first ones to do so. In very short order, there were a lot more smartphones hitting the marketplace. And all of a sudden there was a lot of competition for Apple. There's now Android phones and um, Microsoft phones and all kinds of other smartphone brands that are cutting into that profit. Is it, you know, now I can get this much cheaper smartphone, am I going to get that one or am I going to get the iPhone? So that's all growing as that uh, demand in that product market is growing. Lower prices. During the introduction stage, companies can very often charge early adopters a premium price for a new product. However, in response to the growing number of competitors, they're likely to enter the market during the growth phase. Manufacturers may have to lower their prices in order to achieve the desired increase in sales. So, you know, iPhones are getting more expensive as they grow, but however, um, they do drop those prices for older models. So you're not going to pay $400 anymore for an iPhone 4. Probably going to get that pretty cheap now because they keep developing it. If we go back to the solar roof example, they, you know, and solar panels in general, they used to be extremely expensive. Now they're starting to hit where more and more people can afford to put solar panels on their house. And a different marketing approach. Marketing campaigns during the introduction stage tend to benefit from all the buzz and hype that surrounds the launch of a new product. But once a product becomes established, it's no longer new. A more sophisticated marketing approach is likely to be needed in order to make the most of the growth potential in this phase. Um, 
So when a new product comes out, people are like, oh, it's new. Hey, this is new. You've never tried this before. You've never seen that before. And just being new is enough of a marketing campaign. When something's no longer new, how do you make it interesting? How is this still fresh, different, better? Um, how is this still something that you need? Instead of needing the new and the different and the now, how do you still need what you had before? Benefits of the growth stage. Uh, costs are reduced. The new product development and, and marketing, the introduction stage is usually the most costly phase of a product's life cycle. In con contrast, the growth stage can be the most profitable, pro profitable part of the whole cycle for a manufacturer. As production increases to meet demand, manufacturers are able to reduce their costs through the economies of scale and established routes to market will also become a lot more efficient. Uh, greater consumer awareness. During the growth phase, more and more consumers become aware of the new product. This means that the size of the market will start to increase and there will be a greater demand for the product, which all leads to the relatively sharp increase in sales that is characteristic of the growth stage. Increase in profits. With lower costs and significant increase in sales, most manufacturers will see an increase in profits during the growth stage, both in terms of overall amount of profit they make and the profit margin for each product they sell. So really everything has become streamlined. Um, we're no longer doing massive research and development. We've got our product. We've got, we can establish the, how much we need, how fast we can get it. Everything is in place. We are now set for profit, profit, profit. Product life cycle management in the growth stage. The standard product life cycle curve typically shows that profits are are at their highest during the growth stage. But in order to try and ensure that the product has as long as life as possible, it's often necessary for manufacturers to reinvest some of those profits in marketing and promotional activity during this stage to help guarantee continued growth and reduce threat from the competition. So if you say, okay, well, we're Apple and we have our iPhone, how are we continuing to make sure that people will buy our this product over our competition? There's tons of competition out there. How are we still reinventing ourselves, still driving demand, still driving the consumer need um, to make sure that we're still keeping our market share and not getting eased out by all the competition surrounding us? That's the whole point of like keeping this momentum going. And then we hit the maturity stage. So what are some of the challenges of the maturity stage? Well, one is sales volumes peak. After a steady increase in sales during the growth stage, the market starts to become saturated as there are fewer new customers. The majority of the consumers who are ever going to purchase a product have already done so. Um, decreasing market share. Another characteristic of the maturity stage is the large volume of manufacturers who are all competing for a share, share of the market. With this stage of the product life cycle often seeing the highest level of competition, it becomes increasingly challenging for companies to maintain their market share. And profits start to decrease. While the stage may be when the market as a whole makes the most profit, it is often the part of the product life cycle where a lot of manufacturers can start to see their profit decrease. Profits will have to be shared amongst all the competitors in the market, and with sales likely to peak during the stage, any manufacturer that loses market share and experiences a fall in sales is likely to see a subsequent fall in profits. This decrease in profits could be compounded by the falling prices that are often seen when a sheer number of competitors forces some of them to, to try attracting more customers by competing on price. So in the maturity stage you have the most amount of people competing for the same amount of market share. So anybody that's going to buy this product has already done so. If you think about smartphones when they came out Nobody had one. Everybody was rushing to buy them because they were new and they were great. Now everybody has one. So everybody that's going to buy one probably already has one. Um, there's not going to be 10 tons of new customers in that marketplace. So there's more and more um, demand. There's more and more competition, but there's no more new consumers jumping into this market. So even though that whole industry is becoming more pro still seeing profits, there's so much competition that individual companies may not be making a lot of money or maybe losing money where they'd had previously made more. The benefits of the maturity stage. So there's a continued reduction in costs. Just as economies of scale in the growth stage help to reduce costs, 
Developments in production can lead to even more efficient ways to manufacture high volumes of a particular product, helping to lower costs even further and increase market share through differentiation. While the market may reach saturation during the maturity stage, manufacturers might be able to grow their market share and increase profits in other ways, through the use of innovative marketing campaigns and by offering more diverse product features companies can actually improve their market share through differentiation and there are plenty of product life cycle examples of businesses being able to achieve this. So in the maturity stage, um, companies may kind of diversify what they offer where in one instance they may say, well, you know, we're Coca-Cola, all we ever make is Coca-Cola. Well, they hit that maturity stage and say, well, we have Coke, how about Diet Coke? How about Cherry Coke? How about Vanilla Coke? How about New Coke? Oh wait, no, New Coke is terrible. Back to Old Coke. Um, we have all these, you know, we're going to have special Coca-Cola flavors for the holidays and special bottle designs for the summer and um, for Halloween and all these differentiation of like, oh, this is it's a product you've seen your whole life but we made it new and different so that you may want to still purchase us. We've now got Coca-Cola with your name on it. Look, now you have to look and see if you can find your name. That's a way that you can increase your market share by making it new and different, even though it's still your product. It's still the product it always has been. Um, we made it new, different, slightly cooler um, to really uh, attract new customers or keep customers coming back. There's that continued redu um, reduction in costs. So um, if your product is still strong in the marketplace, you can still continue to streamline production, streamline, um, you know, if you've been in, in the market for a long time, you can more accurately predict how many things you're gonna, you know, how much to order, how much volume you're gonna sell in a particular quarter. Product life cycle management in the maturity stage. So the maturity stage of a product life cycle presents manufacturers with a wide range of challenges. With sales reaching their peak and the market becoming saturated, it can be very difficult for companies to maintain their profits, let alone continue trying to increase them, especially in the face of what's usually fairly intense competition. During this stage, it is organizations that look for innovative ways to make their product more appealing to to the consumer that will maintain and perhaps even increase their market share. So in this maturity stage, um, the marketplace is pretty saturated. You've got lots of competitors all vying for your attention. So some things that do happen in the maturity stage is some of those competitors will eventually lose out um, because the market is so saturated that some of the smaller ones will simply drop away. So. Um, Companies and products that stay strong during the maturity stage can start to kind of keep or gain a little bit more of their market share that they may have lost during intense competition. And then challenges of the decline stage. So now that we've passed the maturity stage, we're hitting decline. So the market is in decline. During this final phase of a product life cycle, the market for a product will start to decline. Consumers will typically stop buying this product in favor of something newer and better. And there's generally not much a manufacturer will be able to do to prevent this. Falling sales and profits. As a result of a declining market, sales will start to fall and the overall profit that is available to the manufacturers in the market will start to decrease. One way for companies to slow this fall in sales and profits is to try increase their market share, which, while challenging enough during the maturity stage of a cycle, can be even harder when the market is in decline. And then product withdrawal. Ultimately, for a lot of manufacturers, it could get to a point where they are no longer able to make a profit from their product, as there may be no way to reverse this decline. The only option many businesses will have is to withdraw their product before it starts to lose them money. So those are some of the challenges of the decline stage. Your market is going away. New technology has come out. Better products have come out. Different styles, different flavors. Um, society is just kind of going away from that product as something cool, new, hip, different, needed. Um, so while some products are able to just kind of hang on to that loyal customer base, other products may have to withdraw their, um, from the market just because they're starting to lose money. So benefits of the decline stage. Cheaper production. Even during the decline stage, there may be opportunities for companies to continue selling their products at a profit, 
if they're able to reduce their costs by looking at alternative manufacturing options, using different techniques, or moving production to another location, a business may be able to extend the profitable life of a product. Cheaper markets for some manufacturers, another way to continue making profit from a product during the decline stage may be to look at, to new cheaper markets for sales. In the past, the profit potential from these markets may have not been justified the investment need to enter them. But companies often see things differently when the only other alternative might be to withdraw a product altogether. So you may enter um, more of the knockoff or bargain store markets where your product may have been high end. Now it may be in, you know, a Kmart or a Walmart where it used to have been in more, if you're a fashion, you were more in higher stores, you know, fashionable um, boutiques type of things. Cheaper production, you can still... Um, you've got production nailed, you can, you know, move it to a cheaper facility, you can just use up some of the stuff you've already produced. Product life cycle management in the decline stage. Many products going through the decline stage of a product life cycle will experience a shrinking market coupled with falling sales and profits. For some companies, it will simply be a case of continuing to manufacture product as long as it is economically viable but withdrawing it as soon as that is not the case. However, depending on a particular markets involved, some companies may be able to extend the life of their product and continuing in making a profit by looking at alternative means of productions and newer and cheaper markets. Even in the decline stage, a product can still be viable, and the most successful manufacturers are those that focus on effective product life cycle management, allowing them to make the most of the potential of each and every product the company launches. So... During this, you're in a decline stage, your, your product is not really all that desired anymore. If you really are, you know, trying to still make a profit, you're saying, okay, well, where is our product still popular? It may still be popular in certain niche markets. There may still be enough people buying this product that, you know, doesn't warrant totally yanking it from the shelves because you may risk your brand integrity if you say, well, yeah, we still sell. 300,000 cases of this product a year, okay, well, let's just get it to the markets where people are buying it. If there's certain regions of the U.S. that say, hey, this, this product is really popular in the South, okay, we're only going to sell it in the South. We're not even going to bother trying to keep it on the shelves in North Dakota because no one's buying it there. We're just going to have it in the South because that's where we still have a really strong um, consumer base. That's an example of how some companies still really look at this and say, okay, we're not going to go nationwide. We're just going to go regionally where this may still be popular and keep our core consumer base. A lot of companies may just say, okay, well, you can't get this product in stores anymore, but you can buy it online and we'll ship it to you from our manufacturing, from our warehouses. It costs them a lot less, so they're not trucking it to brick and mortar stores, but where it's still alive in some form that people can go online who are still loyal to that company and they can purchase it. So that's good product. That's good management of a product during the decline stage is still saying, okay, let's see who's buying it and is still making money for us. Let's focus on how we can still make a profit from that. So some product life cycle examples, um, 3D TVs, may or may not actually be a good example. I don't think they're taking off, but if you think about um, digitally streaming, cloud service, um, on-demand um, entertainment that you can get to from your phone, to your laptop, to your tablet, to your TV. That's probably the newest way where that's still an innovative market. How can I get entertainment where I am, wherever I am? A slightly older example was something um, would be Blu-ray players. They've been around a while. People, it's still having steady sales. Um, it might be hitting maturity stage now versus a growth stage. Um, DVD players definitely maturity stage, if not decline, um, because they've been around for quite a long time. You can still buy DVDs. However, um, you know when DVD players were introduced, they were hundreds of dollars. Now you can get one for uh, five bucks at a garage sale, twenty bucks brand new at Walmart. So they're still around, they're still holding in that maturity stage. However, they're headed into decline as um, people aren't really collecting these discs anymore. And if you think of something extremely in decline would be VCRs. 
Um, you can still buy VCR. There's still people out there who have VCR and VCR tapes. Um, definitely the decline stage. It's just easier and cheaper to get um, more modern formats. It's very hard if you were trying to, you know, go out if you wanted to go out and buy blank videotape. That's, that's going to be tough to do. However, if you wanted to record with something else, there's a lot better technologies to go out with and record than your handheld camcorder. Another example, uh, product life cycle, uh, virtual reality. Virtual reality has been around for uh, quite a few decades, I believe. Um, but it's only been recently that it's widely available in the marketplace and affordable. You can go get the VR goggles pretty cheaply anywhere. Um, that doesn't mean that it's the most popular format around. However, virtual reality is a really up-and-coming um, concept. A lot of things are going to move towards a more immersive VR technology. Something that's in the growth stage would still be um, tablets, tablet PCs, iPads. So there's a growing number of tablet uh, PCs for consumers to choose from. As this product passes through the growth stage of the cycle and more competitors start to come into the market, that is really developed after the launch of Apple's iPad. Apple came out with the iPad. It was very exciting. It was something people hadn't really seen before. Um, and very quickly, a lot of competitors entered that marketplace. So that was a new market that they've created and a lot of competition is out there. So this one might also be kind of hitting that maturity stage. It's hard, kind of hard to gauge, I guess. Um, because you still see a lot of competitors entering the marketplace. You can get a tablet for 20 bucks or free um, pretty easily any place. There's a lot out there. Then laptops are definitely in the maturity stage. Laptop computers have been around for a very long time, but more advanced components as well as diverse features that appeal to different segments of the market will help sustain this product as it passes through the maturity stage. So people still need laptops, they still need a full computer as opposed to just owning a tablet. Um, however, you know, laptops are starting to be replaced by more mobile technology. More people are working with just their phones or tablets than a full laptop computer. And then something that's definitely in the decline is a typewriter. Typewriters and even electronic word processors have very limited functionality with consumers demanding a lot for, more from electronic equipment they buy. Typewriters are a product that is passing through the final stage of a product life cycle. You can still buy typewriters. They still are out there. Um, it's really tough to find one unless you're going to, say, a secondhand store. However, there's still that niche market. Um, when I talked about there's not a lot of people buying a typewriter, there's still a very small market of people who say, no, I want a typewriter want the old school typewriter with the ribbon, let's do this. So there's a small niche consumer market that are still going to purchase these things. New product development. Idea to research to develop to testing to analysis to intro. So when we have new product development, uh, we always start with the idea. Every product has to start with an idea. In some cases this might be fairly simple, basing the new product on something similar that already exists. In other cases, it might be something revolutionary and unique, which may mean the idea generation part of the process is much more involved. In fact, many of the leading manufacturers have, will have a whole department that focuses solely on the task of coming up with the next big thing. So every product starts somewhere. You've got an idea. It might be a million dollar idea. Uh, however, it might be a million dollars to come up with it. So the next thing after we've got our idea, we've got our new product, is research. An organization may have plenty of ideas for a new product, but once it uh, has selected the best of them, the next step is to start researching the market. This enables them to see if there's likely to be a demand for this type of product and also what specific features need to be developed in order to meet the to best meet the needs of this potential market. Development. The next stage is the development of the product. Prototypes might be modified through various design and manufacturing stages in order to come up with a finished product that consumers will want to buy. The next step is testing. Before most products are launched, the manufacturer spends a large amount of money on production and promotion. Most companies will test their new product with a small group of actual consumers. 
This helps to make sure that they will have a viable product that will be profitable and that there is no changes that need to be made before it's launched. So you've heard of beta testing before, um, test markets, test consumers. Let's test this product in small areas and see if people like it. What can we change? What can we make different to make sure that when this goes nationwide, worldwide, we got it right. And then analysis, looking at the feedback from consumers testing enables the manufacturers to make any necessary changes to the product and also decide how they're going to launch to it to the market. With information from real consumers, they'll be able to make a number of strategic decisions that will be crucial to the product's success, including what price to sell and how the product will be marketed. Lastly is the introduction. Finally, when a product has made it all the way through to the new market development stage, the only thing left to do is introduce it to the market. Once this is done, good product lifecycle management will ensure the manufacturer makes the most of all their effort and investment. So that's the new product development. We got an idea, we did some research, we need to develop it, develop it, we need to test it. We need to look at our results from our testing and say, okay, what can we change? What can we make better? Let's do this thing. We're ready to go. We've got it wrapped up. We're confident that the product we're taking to market is going to do well. Um, otherwise, if it's a big fat flop, you've lost a lot of money and time. And this leads us to our in-class project um, for you online kids. This is going to be done individually, and that is re-envisioning a product in the decline stage. So what we're going to do first, you're going to select a product um, from the options. I'm going to walk you through the options you can pick. You're going to reimagine that product and branding to make it current so that is um, current and trendy, keeping in mind new social trends. What about your product is going to change? What is going to stay the same? And how are you going to target a new young audience? So the first product that, uh, op this is your first product option that you can rebrand is Tab Cola. Ooh. Tab Cola came out in the 60s. Um, it came out with a, a brand of sweetener that was immediately pretty much banned. And then they put saccharin in it instead of uh, to be this low um, zero calorie cola. Um, and then when the FDA decided that saccharin had to be labeled with a warning label, um, that really kind of started that decline of the product, that it was being, they had to change it again from saccharin to an aspartame, um, which changed the taste of tab. So some of the marketing challenges for tab cola is moving away from cancer causing artificial sweeteners. So it's... Um, went from being um, the first sweetener which was known to cause cancer, was totally banned, then saccharin, which also had to have a warning label on it for causing cancer, then aspartame, which also is uh, a lot of people stay away from due to being kind of artificial and gross. Um, so the perception that TAB is a healthier alternative, so how can you make TAB actually healthier um, versus, okay, well, this is, you know, it's a diet soda. Sodas aren't so good for you. Diet soda is also not so good for you. And how do you make this not your mom's diet soda? If you think about TAB, um, if you've heard of TAB, some people have not even heard of TAB. This was a, an extremely popular soda in the 70s and 80s because it was one of kind of the original diet colas where it had no sugar in it. So a lot of, um, it's got that perception of being something that older women drink. People who were drinking in the 70s and 80s were probably still drinking it. Um, how do you make it marketed towards a newer, younger audience? Tab had come out with this Tab Energy um, to try and uh, poise themselves into the energy, mar energy drink market. Um, how can you, if this is the product you're going to pick, how can you make Tab a product, a soda that people are going to want to drink, a younger generation is going to want to drink, that it's not associated with something that um, your friend's mom and her mom jeans is drinking? The next product that, 
product option that you can do is FUBU jeans. There's a nice blast from the past picture for you. That's, that's nice. So some of the market challenges for FUBU. At one point, FUBU was worth $350 million. Uh, it was a huge, huge clothing brand for us, by us, um, that all the celebrities were wearing, all the athletes, everybody wore FUBU. It eventually trickled down to where it was being sold in J.C. Penney's, in Sears. Um, you might still find it in some um, cheaper retail stores. So how do you reinvent this, the cool, hip, trendy style that primarily appear, appeals to young urban men? You must differentiate yourself from the previous generation clothing style and market. This is not your dad's FUBU. When FUBU is cool, um, if you still have it, if it's still around, um, it's probably something your dad has in the back of his closet. It's not necessarily, how do you make this young, cool, and hip as it once was? The Surge Cola. That's another option you can rebrand. So marketing challenges for Surge. It is, there is a saturated market in energy drinks. There are 10 tons of energy drinks out there. Um, Surge had questionable ingredients. Um, you can see I've got this nice picture of Surge as it was sold in the European Union. You see that color because of some of the restrictions they have on uh, color you can put in versus the color it was in the US. That's questionable. That's it's not really a color found in nature. Um, and then how do you maintain that cult product following while attracting new customers? Surge was reintroduced into the marketplace because there was such a demand for it. It had been withdrawn from uh, the marketplace and so many people said, hey, we really love this soda, bring it back into the market. How can you bring it back into the marketplace um, to maintain that cult product following while getting new customers? People are saying, well, I don't know if I want it green. Uh, forget. Sorry, it's Urge in the, um, the UK and parts of Europe as opposed to Surge. You can see how they slightly change, but this is the European version of Surge. Um, how do you say, how do you keep your, the, your super loyal customer base and grow your market share. That's your market challenge there. Another option for you to do is JNCO Jeans. JNCO stands for Gene Co. Um, they had, if you're not familiar with JNCO Jeans or Genco Jeans, um, there are these huge wide-legged jeans that were really popular with um, skater punk kids in the 90s. How do you attract new counterculture youth? How do you stay style and trend focused while still maintaining that signature brand? So Jenko is very popular because they'd hired street artists to do their, uh, their tag at JNCO. This crown logo was done by a famous street artist. How do you keep that counterculture youth while maintaining and attracting new consumers? Um, how do you get kids who are in their tweens, teens, and 20s to want to buy this while maintaining some amount of iconic brand identity. How do you make this new and cool again? So what to do? Um, this is going to be individual for the online class. You're going to pick your product, whichever one you want to do. So do you want to do Jenko? Do you want to do Surge? Do you want to do FUBU? Or do you want to do Tab? Go ahead and you get to pick whichever one you would like. Um, and you're going to re-envision the logo and come up with a marketing campaign and slogan for your product. So what's the new logo going to look like? What's your new campaign? What's your new slogan? Um, how are you going to pitch this product for the new generation to say, hey, we're new, we're young, we're cool, we're hip, we're back. Um, refresh your logo to make it look more new and now. Uh, and then you're going to design a new can design for the sodas or a new hang tag for clothing. So we got two clothing options. We got two soda options. What's your new surge can going to look like? What's your new tab can going to look like? What's your new um, FUBU or JNCO hang tag going to look like? What's that? So we say, what's a hang tag? Well, 
you can do a tag that actually hangs off the product or you can do a tag um, here's an example of the hang tag on the JNCO jeans Look, those are 28 inches wide around the bottom so the last part of this is going to be um, designing a web ad at 450 pixels by 750 pixels for your product so now we've got you've got your new logo you've got your slogan you've got your new can design or your hang tag make a quick ad what's your web ad gonna look like you can get extra credit for making a, an animated ad however if it's just a, a static graphic that's cool too so that's the last piece so that's um, I guess that would be five pieces that you're going to four pieces um, coming up with a new logo for your marketing and new logo new slogan new design and an ad four pieces so that's what you're going to turn in for this product, for this project, logo, slogan, can or hang tag, and your web ad. So any questions, make sure to shoot me an email and check for the due date in the Blackboard assignment. So have fun with this. It's meant to think about how are you going to reposition a branded product out there. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.